Well, uh, not only do I want to join Calvin, but I also join Brother David in welcoming everybody here today. It's great to see you. Let me remind you that you can take your sermon supplement, and if you open it up, there's an outline of this morning's lesson. So if I go a little fast or um, you want to look at some additional scripture verses, you can follow along on your outline. and It'll also be on the screen uh, behind me as, as well. Let me say it's good to be back. Um, I have recovered up. I feel really good. Um, when I was visiting with the doctor, he said, you know, when your gallbladder is removed, you can expect to lose a few pounds. And I said, well, doc, take half my liver, a pancreas, and a kidney while you're in there. But he didn't. But we're real thankful here at Northwest to have six men that are preachers. Six men are preachers here. And I thank uh, uh, for those who filled in for me in class and also Brother Richard bringing the messages uh, last Sunday. As always, he does an outstanding job. This week, there was a, um, a story that went viral. It was the story of a 69-year-old lady called, named Emily Phillips. And you probably saw this. If you have Yahoo, it was one of the leading stories at the top of the Yahoo page. And I know uh, Google had a big section on it as well. But uh, Emily Phillips was a 69-year-old grandmother who went to her doctor, and the doctor discovered that she was in the end stages of pancreatic cancer. She didn't even know. She wasn't even having any discomfort. And she passed away just 29 days later. Before she passed, she gathered her family together, and she said, Listen, I, um, I want to do something a little different. And she said, what I'd like to do is, I, instead of you writing my obituary, which, you know, she didn't doubt that they would not do a fine job, they would. But she said, instead of you writing it, will you let me write my obituary? And if you had a chance to read that, you saw the things that she wrote. She had a wonderful wit about her. She talked about her family, her children, her grandchildren. She talked about all the things that she was able to do in life. She traveled. She saw things that she never thought she'd be able to see. She, she expressed in her obituary that she had lived a full life. And she began it with a very straightforward and honest sentence. She began her obituary by saying, I was born, I blinked, and it was over. And what Miss Phillips is talking about is the brevity of life. How short it is. How sometimes we, we get so caught up in the things that we need to do. And listen, some of those things are extremely important. They require your time. You have to give yourself over to them. There are things that, that take a great amount of time because they're important things that need to be done. But sometimes we get so caught up in living that we forget it's very short, this time here on earth. We, we, we forget that as the hours tick away that those are lost hours that we'll never get back. That we'll never have the opportunity to go back and to pull some of those hours that were wasted and apply them to tomorrow or the day after that. We simply can't do that. And what we have to continue to remind ourselves of is the fact that, that Emily Phillips is right. I mean, we're born and we have this short period of life and then it's on, over. The government says that the average male will live to be 72. 72. Now, the interesting thing about that is that the generation that I'm raising up, my children, they're expected to have an even lower lifespan because of health, uh, the way the foods are today. Their lifespan isn't expected to be 72 years of age for a man. For a woman, it's 76. Now, those are the averages. So if a man lives to 76 and a woman lives to uh, 72 and a woman lives to 76, they're at the high end of life expectancy. They're blessed. But the vast majority of people will never see 72 or 76. Think how short that is. The vast majority of us will be lucky if we can get 65, maybe 69. Some of us even less. What's it show? Wow. Our time here is so short. It's such a quick, quick visit that we have before we blink and it's over. 
The Bible speaks to the brevity of life. Um, Emily Phillips wasn't the first person to express this notion that, that life goes by very fast. The, the Bible speaks very clearly to the brevity of life. It doesn't hide it. It doesn't try to gloss over it and say, well, you know, think about other things. Don't worry about this. Be, be thinking about other things around you and, and you won't you know, feel bad or things are going quick. The Bible is straightforward and it says, listen, life is short. And, and because it's short, there are things that we need to accomplish. There are things that we must give ourselves over to. And this brevity of life is expressed in a multitude of, of different ways. In James chapter 4 and verse 14, James describes the brevity of life as being nothing more than a vapor. Some of you are reading from a translation that says we're a mist. I mean, we appear for just a short time and then we disappear. The psalmist in Psalm 102 and verse 11 expressed the brevity of life as being the fact that we're like a shadow. I mean, we're, we're here for a moment, and then we simply just fade away. We see again in the book of Psalms, in Psalm 78 and verse 39, that the brevity of life is expressed to us as being simply we're like a, a wind that just blows on by. We're like a, a wind, our life, that simply is blowing out there in the breeze. And before we know it, it's over. I like this quote. It's on your outline if you notice it. An individual said this, I would if I could stand on a busy corner, hat in hand, and beg people to throw me all their wasted hours. When I read that quote, you know what I thought? I thought, me too. I'd give anything to get back some of those hours that I simply threw away. I mean, I, I, would, I would give anything. I would try to overcome any type of hurdle to, to be able to add to my life those years that have passed by, those years that are gone, those moments that I just didn't feel were important or cherish them or take responsibility for them, and I just wasted it all away. I'd love to stand on the corner and say, give me some of your wasted moments. I'll take them. I'll use them. But you know, we don't have to be a people who despair. Though the Bible presents to us the understanding that yes, indeed, life is short. The Bible doesn't give us the understanding that we ought to then abandon all hope. We're not a people who, who are called to live with a, a sour disposition that says, well, since it's short, who cares? Since I won't be here long, I'm not going to try to achieve anything. Just the opposite is taught to us. Because life is short, we're told to act. We're told to live. We're told to be responsible for the time. I want to highlight a couple of the, the things that we can do, some suggestions that you and I can do to, to make the most of our time. There's a phrase called carpe diem. You've probably heard it. It means seize the day. Take responsibility for the day that you have. Take responsibility for the time that you have. I want to give you some suggestions that we can do to take responsibility for our time. Here's the first one. We can live as one that is a new creation. With life being short, we need to be saved. With life just being such a, a fading shadow or a passing breeze, you and I need to make sure that we're ready for the moment when our life ends. And to be ready, we need to be saved. We need to be like the people in Acts chapter 2 and verse 37 who cried out to Peter as he preached. What is it that we need to do? What are you requiring of us? What needs to take place for me to be right with God? And he tells them that they need to repent. That they need to be baptized. And that in being baptized they will receive the remission of their sins, the forgiveness of their sins, and the gift of the Holy Spirit. Life is so short. Peter didn't dance around their question. He didn't try and sweet talk them with these flowery words. He got right to the point. Listen, you're right. What do you need to do? You need to be right with God. And in being right with God and being a people who come into that saved relationship, Jesus describes it as being born again in John chapter 3 and verse 3 and verse 5. That we need to be individuals who are born again. And the Bible presents a picture of just how important that is for us. Go over to 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse 17. And Paul says this, Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he's a new creation. Old things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. With the short time that we have, we can become this new creation. We can take advantage of the, of the time that we have in front of us to do those things that show to the world and certainly show to the God that we serve that we take serious being saved. 
that it really matters to us whether or not we're in a right relationship with God. Go over for just a minute there to Galatians chapter 2. And if you notice in verse 20, Paul says these words, I have been crucified with Christ. I've died. I've died with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. If my life is going to be short, I want to make sure it's filled with faith. If my time is going to be short, I want it filled with the understanding that I certainly believe that Jesus Christ is the only way that I can go to God. John chapter 14 and verse 6. And that I understand that because life is short, I need to be ready for that moment when it ends. And to be ready, I have to be a new creation. I have to be a person of faith. Let me give you one more. If you go over to to Romans chapter 6 and in verse 6, and I'm cutting into the midst of a great chapter there. But in Romans 6 and verse 6, Paul says this, Knowing this, that our old man was crucified with him, that the body of sin might be done away with, that we should no longer be slaves of sin. That's how we redeem our time, church. That's how we become a people who when life is nearing, or when it's growing down, winding down, ending up, when when we are, are that person who says, listen, I'm at my 72 or I'm at my 76. I've been blessed to live above the norm. When we understand that, where people say, you know what, I'm thankful for that time. And because I was thankful for it, I redeemed it. I was one that made sure that I didn't live a life of sinfulness. I lived a life of forgiveness through the blood of Jesus Christ. Ephesians 1 and and verse 7. How do you live? Your time is short. Are you living as a new creation? Here's a second suggestion. The Bible gives us the understanding that we need to live a life that is focused. That is focused. And we can think of things like Matthew chapter 6 and verse 33 where where Jesus reminds us to seek first the kingdom of God and His righteousness. He's talking about what things occupy our time, what our focus is on. I like the things that are recorded over there. If you go over to Proverbs 8 and, and verse 17, it says, I love those who love me. God is the one that's speaking. I love those who love me and those who seek me diligently will find me. That's a focused life. Do you, do you spend time during the week? Do you spend time daily making sure that you give God that attention? That, hey, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go to Him. I'm going to read my, uh, the Scriptures. I'm going to put in some time of studying the Word of God. I'm going to make sure that I'm a person of prayer, that I speak to my Creator each and every day, that we have that focus that says, well, I need to have a relationship with God. It's essential that I have a relationship with God. I like the way Paul says it. If you go over there to to Colossians chapter 3 and beginning in verse 1, Paul gives us this understanding. If then you were raised with Christ, if you're saved, if you are a new creation, if you've been born again, he says, if then you were raised with Christ, seek those things which are above where Christ is sitting at the right hand of God. Notice verse 2. Set your mind on things above, not on things of the earth. Are you focused on the eternal? uh, eternal? Are you focused on the Godhead? Are you focused on the spiritual aspect of your life? Are you focused on the God who so desperately loves you? Who is so infatuated with you that he set a time in the history of creation when he sent his son to die for you? For you, with life being short, do you live a life that's focused? Here's a third suggestion that I'll give to you. We need to live as one that is obedient. Obedient. Um, I, I like the words that are spoken here in Jeremiah chapter 7. Of course, Jeremiah is addressing the people of Israel, the, the people of God. Um, he's addressing in, in the entire uh, book of, of Jeremiah there, he's addressing the fact that they've wandered from God. They haven't been obedient to God. And so it's very important when we look there at verse 23 of chapter 7, it's very important what Jeremiah says because he's talking about a people that can be redeemed, that can be brought back into a good relationship with God. And what he talks about is obedience. And it has an application to you and I today. You know, we don't struggle with obedience. We know what it is. When the boss says, listen, the work day starts at 8. You don't show up at 9.30 and say, well, you know, I didn't know if, you know, I really needed to be obedient to that. But we understand obedience. In Jeremiah 7 verse 23, he says this, but this is what I command them. God speaking. 
But this is what I commanded them, saying, Obey my voice, and I will be your God, and you shall be my people, and walk in all the ways that I have commanded you, that it may be well with you. It's a very simple plea from God. Obey me. There, there's, there's nothing complicated. There's, there's, there's nothing that's added to it that might lead to any type of confusion for us as a people of faith. What he says to the nation of Israel, he says to us today, walk according to the things that I have given you. It reminds me of what Paul said over in 2 Timothy chapter 3, beginning in verse 16. All scripture is God breathed. And is useful for teaching, correcting, rebuking, and training in righteousness. What's the end result? Well, verse 17, so that the man of God may be thoroughly equipped. The word there is anthropos. It's gender neutral. So that the people of God may be thoroughly equipped. Why? Well, because life is short. And because life is short, we can't be a people who say, well, maybe one day I'll get around to being obedient. Or maybe one day I'll turn my thoughts or my attentions to God. Or maybe one day I'll be a person who will open up my Bible and read it. Now listen to me, church. That day may never come. You don't know the span of your days. We don't know if we have tomorrow. It's not given to us as a fact. The Lord might return today. Will we be ready for that? Will He find us as a people that are living an obedient life? Let me give you a fourth Suggestion. We need to live as one that forgives and loves. I, I'm going to touch on that again tonight, and we've looked at that a few times in the last several weeks as I've been preaching. And I just see in the pages of Scripture this importance that is given to us about how we relate to one another. And I, I'll give you the suggestion that I think the Bible touches so much on forgiveness and love because it can be difficult. Now, I'll speak for myself. It's hard at times. It's hard at times to be one who says, okay, I'll go ahead and dismiss, dismiss that wrong. I won't think anything about it. Why, well, I forgive you for what you've done. It's a struggle sometimes to let go of it or to not hold on to it and say, well, there's going to be a time in the future when something's going to come up and, well, then I can pull this wrong or this hurt or this slight and I can pull it out and say, well, let me remind you of what you did to me in the past. So the Bible, knowing that we are a people who tend to do that, it's not unique to me. And listen, it's not unique to you. Paul is writing in several different places in the New Testament. John writes several different places in the New Testament. Mark in his gospel records several different times that, listen, we need to be a people that forgive because we struggle with it. And we need to want, be one that lives a life that loves. Go over to uh, Mark chapter 11, and if you go to verse 25, Jesus is the one who's doing the speaking. Mike, Mark is recording what was said, writing it down for us. And Jesus says this, And whenever you stand praying... If you have anything against anyone, forgive him, that your Father in heaven may also forgive you your trespasses. Verse 26, but if you do not forgive, neither will your Father in heaven forgive your trespasses. I love verse 25, and it's real simple. It's not complicated. It's not hard. What do I need to do? Because I've been forgiven, well, I need to forgive. Verse 26 is the difficult place. Verse 26 is where we really try to, try to you know, get things going because we can be a little hard-headed and reaching the understanding that if I don't forgive, it has an impact on my relationship with God. And it's hard, this verse 26 type of living. But we're called to do it. I, I've said this several times in, in many lessons. The Bible doesn't call us to do the impossible. You, you know that, right? The Bible doesn't intentionally set us up to be a people of failure. It doesn't say, listen, I want you to be a people that forgive. And then there's a little side comment that says, but I, I know you'll never do it. I know you can't do it. I know you're not capable of it. That's not how the Bible presents itself to us. It presents those things that you and I can do. It presents those things that you and I can achieve. And the understanding is that you and I can be a people that forgive those around us. Again, it may be difficult, it may be a challenge for us, but it's not impossible. Well, the same thing is also true about love. Go over to 1 John for just a second. And chapter 4, and, and John says this in verse 11. Now, in chapter 4, John talks a lot about love. We're looking at one verse. But John says this, Beloved, if God so loved us, and hasn't he? Jesus Christ being the propitiation for our sins. A way to be reunited back with God given to us through the blood of Jesus Christ. Well, surely 
God has expressed His love to us. Beloved, if God so loved us, we also ought to love one another. It's not presented as a suggestion. It's um, not presented as a maybe. The, the thing that we're being called to is to be a people that not just forgive, but that a people who back up that forgiveness with the understanding that we need to love those around us. And again, I understand that's hard. You know why? Because not everybody acts like us. Not everybody likes what we like. Not everybody agrees with the things that we agree with. And we kind of rub each other the, the, the wrong way a time or two. And it's difficult. But love we must. Love we must. Are you living a life? that forgives and loves. Let me share with you another one here, a a fifth one. We need to live as one that is ready to die. Well, Brother Don, that's what you've been talking about the whole time, and it's true. But we ought to be a people, knowing that life is short, we need to be a people that consider the time that our life might end, and we need to be prepared for it. And I see that in Psalm 116, if you go over there. And the psalmist says in 116 and verse 15, these words, precious, some of you have a a translation that says cherished. It highlights the importance of what's about to be said. Precious in the sight of the Lord is the death of his saints. Well, that doesn't say much about how I live. Oh, it says a lot about how we live. Because the brevity of life here is expressed in the fact that when we die, if we have been faithful... If we've lived as that new creation, if we've been focused, if we've been obedient, if we've been one who has stressed forgiveness and has given ourselves over to love, then we can be one that when we die, God will say of us something very specific. Precious in my sight is the death of one of my saints. That's you and I. He's talking about us. And if we've lived a life of 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 relationship with God, a life in which we've grown in our relationship with Him, in which we've matured and enjoyed that relationship with Him. When our time comes to pass, God will say of us, what a great servant. I'm not looking for perfection. Romans 3 and verse 23, all sin. What a faithful child of mine. And their passing, because of their faithfulness, well, it's precious in my sight. Now, if you notice, verse 16 there, uh, verse uh, 15 there doesn't cover the opposite side of the coin. How does God see the passing of those who have not been righteous? Well, in expressing how he sees the death of the righteous, we get the understanding. It's precious when a faithful person dies. It's not precious when an unfaithful person dies. Well, the question for us is simple. Are we living a life in which we understand that we're ready to die? That it will be something that God will say is precious? Let me give you one more. One more. We need to live as a people that expect heaven. We need to live as one that expects heaven. Do you think about heaven? And all the things that we have to do and all the things that are taking place around us, do, do you spend time consciously making an effort to think about heaven? You know, I do. I do. I think about what, how different it's going to be from what we're experiencing now. I think about how incredible it's going to be for that moment when I have the opportunity to look into the eyes of the one who died for my sins. Wow. Wow. To be able to take hold of his, his, his form, to be able to see the color of his eyes and the texture of his beard, to be able to know that this is the one that went to the cross so that I could have eternal life. I, I think about that a lot. I think about what it's like going to be like to be in the presence of God. This one that we are told in Scripture that he, he dwells in inapproachable light. Imagine the beauty that that must be. In fact, it's John as he is given the, the revelation. It's John who gives us the understanding that there won't be any sun or moon in heaven. God is its light. I, I think about that. And then the understanding that the Holy Spirit who is given to dwell in us at the moment of our conversion, at the moment in which we are baptized, that that spirit and all the things that were done will all be settled up, will all come to fruition, will all be fulfilled. And there before me, in heaven for eternity, will be the Godhead. I, I think about that a lot. 
I think about those who have gone ahead of us that are in paradise right now that we'll get to see in, in heaven. I think about those that I've been concerned about those who have expressed no desire to me to be in a right relationship with God, nor have they expressed any desire that they feel that they need to be forgiven from their sins. I, I think about those who held that stance and they've now passed away. I think about them when I think about heaven. John says these words in John chapter 14 and in verse 2. Jesus is the one that's doing the speaking. And he says, in my father's house are many mansions. It's big. It's big. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you to myself, that where I am, there you may be also. And that's what we all want, isn't it? I want to be where Christ is. I want to be where my Savior is. And since I understand that life is so short, and since I understand that it's important how I live, am I making those decisions that will give me the assurance, the certainty, that when the brevity of my life comes upon me and I pass away, that I'll be one who will be blessed to see my Savior, knowing that heaven's been prepared for me. L listen to these words from Paul if you go over to uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 2. And in verse 9, Paul says this, But as it is written, eye has not seen, nor ear heard, nor have entered into the heart of man the things which God has prepared for those who love him. That's a verse that just keeps dragging me back in. It keeps beckoning me to come into a relationship with God. As much as I can think about it, as all the things that I can imagine, God is more than that. Of all the things that I think that God has planned for me, God has more planned for me than I haven't even fathomed, that I can't even express or think of. All of that is for us, church. It's for us. And then the author of, of Hebrews, in Hebrews chapter 13, and if you go over there to verse 14, the author says this, For here we have no continuing city. Listen, none of this was created to be eternal. It's not something odd that your car gets older every year and eventually will fall apart. It doesn't matter how brand new it is today. It's going to reach a point where it's no good. It, where it's, 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 it's corroded. Life is made to, to wear out. We as a people, there's nothing wrong with the fact that we look in the mirror and we begin to see a little bit more gray, a little bit more gray, a little bit more gray. Or for some of us, it doesn't mean something's wrong when we look in the mirror and we see a little less hair and a little less hair and a little less hair. Nothing odd is happening to us. We're, continued, we're, we're, we're a people who continue to grow old, to age. And here the author of Hebrews is reminding us that we don't have a continuing city here. All of this is perishable. All of this is going to be nothing but, but rubble. It's all coming to an end. He says this, but we seek the one to come. I'm looking forward, the author says, to eternity in heaven with God. I'm looking forward to the place that I'm created to live in. Hell wasn't created for me. Hell wasn't created for you. Hell is not a desire that God has for us. It's eternity in heaven with Him. It is His goal. It is His ambition. And it is ultimate desire for us that we be saved. And that we be with Him. Now when we think of it in terms like that, how can we not be a people that live expecting heaven? And all the wonderful things about it. How are you living? When you consider this morning the brevity of life, are there things that you can think about and say, well, you know, maybe, maybe that thing that I'm involved in right here isn't worthy of my time. I mean, my time is precious. My time is short. And I don't get it recharged. I'm not going to get it back again. It's gone. And maybe there are some things in my life that I simply need to say, you know what? I don't have time for that anymore. Or knowing how important the time is that I have, I'm getting rid of that and I'm going to start engaging in this over here. I'm not going to get involved in this anymore. I'm going to start getting involved over here. Why? Because this is a better use of my time, which is so short and so precious, and this is just throwing it away over here. And I don't want anything to do with it anymore. There's a quote, I don't know who said it, but it goes something like this. Nobody ever lays on their deathbed and says, I wish I would have spent more time at the office. 
It's just the opposite. I wish I would have spent more time with my children. I wish I would have spent more time with that spouse whose hand I held for 40, 50, 60 years. I wish I would have spent more time with that loved one who's passed away and I don't have the ability to love on them and to talk to them anymore. You know, when I was a, a young preacher preaching in Farmerville, the, the parsonage was right behind the church building and there was a, a walkway that led from my office door to the house and there was a gate. There was a gate. And it seemed that it happened almost every day, but it didn't. But Bailey and Bryce were just little then. And they would walk down to that gate knowing I was in the office and they would shake that gate and they would rattle that gate. And I mean, it would just echo through my office and I would call Alicia and say the kids are down at the gate again and they're shaking it and she'd come get them you know I'd give anything to have those two kids rattling that gate again I'd give anything and instead of picking up the phone and calling Alicia and say will you tell those kids to stop <sighs> should have put down my work and gone out there and loved on them life is short friends it's too short for us to waste it with stuff that is insignificant, sinful, and not even beneficial to us. It's too short for that. Be mindful of how you live. And live a life that redeems each and every second of the days that you have. A life that glorifies the God who loves you. Be mindful of how you live. Brother David's going to lead us in our song of invitation this morning. 662 is going to be the number. It won't be on the screen, so you'll need to turn in your songbook to 662. And if you're here this morning and you're in need of prayer, would you let us pray for you? Would you let us pray with you? If you're here this morning and you are not a member of the Lord's church, now listen, I don't say this to be rude or hateful towards you, but listen to me. Friend, you need to be. If you're here this morning and you haven't redeemed the time that you have today to be right with God, well, you still can. The gospel plan of salvation teaches us very simply to hear, believe, repent, confess, and to be baptized. We don't add the saved to the church. God does. Acts chapter 2 and verse 47. We don't take a vote on whether or not you're going to be added to the Lord's church. God adds you himself. And if you're here this morning and you're ready to be clothed with Christ, Galatians chapter 3 and verse 27, and you're ready to have your sins taken away, Ephesians 1 and verse 7, Acts chapter 22 and verse 16, if you're ready to become that new creation, John chapter 3, verse 3 and verse 5, well, then we're ready to rejoice with you. We're ready to stand by your side and welcome you as brother and sister in Christ. Listen, if you're subject to the invitation, you come forward as we stand and sing.